House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring. Challenging. Encouraging. Deepening. Strengthening. And enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. We are in part eight of to tithe or not to tithe. And I want to share a, a psalm as well as a verse from Proverbs before we get into the, the message, which is actually part of the message. Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Now, this is one of the, the uh, memory verses. I lear learned this psalm as a believer, as a Christian in the Baptist church. And much of the memorization of scripture, as you've heard me say in uh, Joshua 1 a, about this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein, that you may make your way prosperous and, good, and have good success. These, along with all these other scriptures, especially this one, and in others where it talks about delighting yourself in the laws of God and he will give you the desires of your heart. While at the same time, being in a congregation in a denomination that taught you didn't have to keep the law. And therefore, understanding and trying to memorize scriptures that pertain to the law, while being taught you didn't have to keep the law seemed to be contradictory. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't even think about it at the time. To me, it was just, it was scripture to remember. The thing about scripture, especially here in the Western world, is that even from elementary school and kindergarten, even with our children and as a child, it seems like we're taught that knowledge is power. That the information itself is all we need. You don't have to apply this knowledge. You don't have to do it. Just having it is going to make you wise. Knowledge does not have power until it is applied. It's the application of knowledge. To have knowledge and not do what the knowledge says is what James says, that he that do what the words say and he that hear and do what the word say is the person who shall be blessed. Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. A hearer and not a doer deceive themselves. You don't need the devil to deceive you. All you have to do is know what the word say and don't do it. See, the deception comes with the knowledge. If I've got the knowledge, that's all I need. You see, having the knowledge and not walking in it not doing what it says simply brings deception. So here it is, I as a Christian in a Baptist church learning about a law that I don't have to even do. Just knowing about it is good enough. Well, we found that that is not true. His delight is in the law. You have to delight yourself in it. And in his law, meditate day and night. Well, if I'm going to meditate on the law, I need to know where the law is, right? How am I going to meditate on something? Why would I meditate on something that I'm told I'm not under anymore? Do you hear what I'm saying? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season 
His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. Now, we learned a couple of weeks ago and in our discipleship class that there are three classes of people when it comes down to the kingdom. There is the righteous, whom Peter says will scarcely be saved. Yeshua says that if those days would not shorten, even his elect will not make it in. The righteous will scarcely. Why? Because this journey is a journey to the end. You got to run this race to the end. You got to fight the good fight to the end. Those who overcome, those who keep their race and run their race and fight their fight, in the end shall be rewarded. The crown goes to the one who finishes the course. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so the ungodly are not so. Peter says that there is the righteous who will scarcely be saved. He says if the righteous judgment first begins at the house of Jehovah and if the righteous scarcely be, be saved, where, where shall the sinner and the ungodly? Now you got two classes of people. You got sinners and I was taught to identify myself as a sinner saved by grace. A sinner saved by grace. Peter says, if the righteous, well, wait a minute, there's none righteous. No, not one. No, Yeshua made you righteous. You see, he was the righteous requirement of the law. The law doesn't make one righteous. It's Yeshua who makes us righteous. Do you understand what I'm saying? And therefore, the sinner is one, the Greek hematolos is one who knows what the word says. Look it up. One who knows what the word says, but do what they want to do. And you hear people, and I, I can understand how Christians that I knew would say, you know, I know what the word says. Yep, I know, but. I know I don't pray like I ought to. I know I don't read my Bible like I ought to. I know I don't go to church like I ought to. I know that I don't do what I should be doing all the time, but God knows my heart. <laughs> Peter says, yes, he does. You have a heart that knows what the words say, but you've chosen to do your thing and give the Almighty what you want to give him, not what he requires of you. That's a sinner. The ungodly doesn't even care. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? Being a sinner is a dangerous thing. You want to be righteous, and therefore the blood of Yeshua, which makes us righteous, the spirit of the Almighty that gives us the power to do what we cannot do in our own human, natural, fallen state. A fallen person is not interested in pleasing the Almighty. But one who have accepted Yeshua desire should be to please their father. How do we show we love him? We keep his commandments. Which one? If a person say they love God, but do not keep the commandments of God, the Bible says they are a what? a liar and the truth is not in them. It's not enough to know what the word says. You have to be a doer of the word. Abraham obeyed the almighty and it was attributed unto him for righteousness. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Jehovah knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Proverbs says, trust in Jehovah with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Now, that, that was the only verse in this chapter, verses that, you know, we were taught to memorize. Pretty much all of my Baptist friends knew this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Mm. Lean not to your own understanding. Well, how are you going to trust in him if you don't know his word? Mm. 
Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Jehovah and depart from evil. Well, what is evil? What is evil? You know what evil is according to the Almighty? Evil is one who disobeys his commands. It's that simple. The ungodly is a whole nother story. Evil is the, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Almighty when they began to disobey his Sabbaths and they began to worship other entities. He says, it shall be health to your navel, marrow to your bones. And then there's Proverbs 3, 9. Honor Jehovah with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, we can read this, but if you don't understand the feasts and festivals of Jehovah, this won't make sense. Because he's talking about first fruits. First fruits is associated with Passover. There's Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. First fruits is associated with Shavuot, known in the Christian world as Pentecost. First fruits is, a, is associated with the fall feast, known as Tabernacle. Are you with me? Now, Yeshua did not come to abolish the law. We looked at that. James, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and following, he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. Paul was not sent to abolish the law, nor to preach against the law. Paul believed in the law, taught and practiced the law. And we're going to see today that this is going to be Paul's own words, not some preacher. Because most in the church today believe that Paul taught against the law. This is what they teach. Paul was, a, was a, the apostle to the Gentiles, and Paul taught the Gentiles that they didn't have to keep the laws that the Jewish people kept. But if you don't understand where Paul came from, you won't understand what law Paul is talking about. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the law in the Bible are myriad. In other words, there's the law of the Pharaoh. There were the laws of Nebuchadnezzar. There were the laws of the Romans. Do you hear what I'm saying? There were the laws of men. Unfortunately, when we begin to look at the Bible, we see the word law and assume that is talking about the law of Jehovah. Yeshua came along and said, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you all are not worshiping the Father the way he wants to, work, to be worshiped. Instead, your worship of him is in vain because you are teaching for commandments, the laws, the traditions, the doctrines of men, and thereby, with what you are teaching, you Pharisees and you Sadducees, you're teaching man-made rules, regulations, and traditions that have been handed down from the elders, and therefore you have made the law of God of no effect. Yeshua is addressing two issues, the laws that they were teaching as law and the law of Jehovah that they had stopped teaching. This is the same thing denominations do. Denominations today are teaching their traditions. This is why the Baptist has absolutely nothing to do with those crazy Methodists, those out-to-lunch Pentecostals. And whether churches teach it or not, if you're not part of their sect, you're going to hell. And so because of these teachings, you have staunch Catholics, staunch Baptists, you have churches on two corners opposite of each other, and the people don't even speak to one another. And both of them are reading from this book that says, the way the world is going to know you're my disciple is because of the love you have one for another. Where's the love? It's not there. 
I was in one city, and I'm telling you, on three, three of the four corners, there were three churches. Two of them was of the same denomination. Do you hear what I'm saying? And none of them had anything to do. Oh, yeah, they had their ecumenical prayer breakfast. But when it came down to fellowship and worship together, nope, we can't worship over there because you all baptize in the name of Jesus. You all baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You all baptize in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. You see, so we can't fellowship with you because your baptismal formula is wrong. We can't fellowship with you because you all only have communion once a month. You all have communion once a year. We have it every week. Can't fellowship with you. Well, how come you have it every week? Because that's what we believe the Bible teach. Well, how come you have it every month? Because that's what we believe the Bible teach. Well, how come you have it once a, uh, once a year? Because that's what we believe the Bible teach. So you got people who are all reading from the same Bible, interpreting the Bible based on their traditions. And this is what Yeshua was addressing. But we're going to see what Paul actually did and what he taught, even concerning the issue of tithe. The tithe had absolutely nothing to do with the tabernacle. We noted a couple of weeks ago that the people brought or they they supported the building the the tabernacle with the redemption monies and with the census we're not going to get back into that but if you were to look at number four five and six of to tithe or not to tithe you'll see this the tabernacle had absolutely nothing to do with tithing as a matter of fact, the people brought offerings of their own free will. Now, here's how the tabernacle was built. Exodus chapter 25. And Jehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. They weren't commanded to bring an offering if they didn't want to. He says, Tell the people to bring me an offering. Whoever desires to do it and it's in their heart to do it and they're doing it willingly, let them do it. Those who don't want to do it, I'm not going to kill them. They're not going to hell. They're not robbing from me. They're not stealing from me. This is a free will offering and you choose to do it. And this is the offering which you shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass, blue and purple, scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. And ram skin, dyed red and badger skin and shittim wood, oil, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the tabernacle sanctuary was built on free will offerings. According to all that I show you after the pattern. Now we're not going to get into this, but there's a pattern here. And this pattern was revealed to Moses and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now Moses is making something from a pattern of that which already exists. And Jehovah is going to show him which already exists, the pattern of it that is going to be replicated in the earth. The tithe has absolutely nothing to do with the temple. David gathered the material Solomon added and built the first temple. And you can read this in 1 Kings chapter 6 through 9. David had a desire to build the temple for Jehovah. Jehovah says, wait a minute. Have I ever in all the time that I've been sojourning with you asked anybody to build me anything? First of all, you can't build something that is going to contain me. However, you're not going to build it. We find out that Solomon gathered he built, and when we see, Solomon hired foreigners to come and build the holy place of Jehovah. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Read it. First Kings chapter 6 through verse 
through chapter 9. And then when Solomon had finished building the temple, he took the things that David had procured and placed them in the temple. Not one place in the Bible do you see Jehovah telling the people to gather funds, tithe and offerings to build him a temple. He didn't do it. Now the assumption is because people want to associate tithe to the tabernacle, tithe to the temple, and the tabernacle nor the temple had anything to do with tithe because tithe was established long before there was a tabernacle, long before there was a priesthood, long before there were Levites, long before there were a temple. Neither did the tithe support the the temple or the tabernacle. But this is what people teach. And there is no supportive scripture. Well, you know, we can't tithe today because there's no temple. So what? Oh, we can't tithe today because there's no Levite. So what? It wasn't built on a Levitical priesthood. It wasn't built on a temple or tabernacle system, ladies and gentlemen. And so people have gotten it warped. But we're bringing some clarity. Tithing was done long before there was a tabernacle or a temple. Last week and the week before, we looked at how the temple was supported by temple taxes and by tribute money. This practice of tithing took place in Yeshua's day. And then last week in part seven, we talked about some scripture where Yeshua said to the Pharisees, you all tithe of your mint, your anus, and all of the, you know, herbs and that's fine but then you leave undone the weight of your matters of the law but he made a statement that most people simply decide they're going to overlook he said these things you should have done you should have tithed you should have tithed but you also should have taken care of all of these other things that you neglected like justice and mercy you see. And today you'll find that there are churches, pastors, preachers who are teaching people that they are supposed to tithe when tithing is in the law, but yet tell people they're not supposed to keep the law. Well, how can you teach people to tithe, which is under the law, but tell people they're not under the law and then tell them if they don't do it, they're cursed with the curse according to the law. See, that's the confusion. Folks say, well, you know, you just, you just adding confusion. No, I'm bringing clarity. Paul did not address tithing. Not one place in the Bible does Paul address tithing. Now, that's to say two things. One, he didn't teach tithe. Two, he didn't teach against tithe. But people choose the latter. When Paul didn't do it, Paul did not teach it because it was already an established practice, not because it had been done away with, for then Paul would have taught against the law. He didn't. The truth is Paul bridges the gap and make the connection between the serving in the temple according to the law and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I'm going to give you Paul's own words. Don't take my word for it. And I challenge you, don't take your preacher's word for it. Take Paul's word. As I've shared before, you know, there are people who want to say the the Samaritans were this and the Samaritans were that. When the Samaritan woman Yeshua met at the well, if you remember, she identified herself. He says, give me something to drink. She said, how can you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for something to drink when you Jews have absolutely nothing to do with us Samaritans? Legitimate, because there was some serious issues between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. And then he says, well, if you knew who it was who was asking you for something to drink, you would instead ask him for a living water. The woman says, How can you give me water and you don't even have anything to draw from? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Are you greater than our father Jacob? 
Jacob is the one who Yeshua, who, who the Bible says, Jehovah changed his name to Israel. Now, here's my point. The, the woman at the well identified herself as an Israelite. The preachers say they were Gentiles. They were mixed breeds. See, here's the issue. People will try to tell you who you are or you are going to have to tell people who you are. If you are quiet, then people will give you a title. People will define you. People will tell you who you are and where your place is. People will tell you what you can and what you cannot do because you allow people to define you. And the Bible says, don't allow people to define you. Only one person on the planet can define who you are. And that's your father who is in heaven. He's the one who've called you. He's the one who've made the plan for you. He's the one who set the course for you. He's the one who established who you are. And therefore your goal is to be to strive to please him, not to try to please people around you. If you please the father in your walk, you will please those who love the father. Those who don't love the father, who cares what they think? Why are we trying to please people who don't even like us? Trying to fit into a society as long as we do what they want us to do, we are accepted by them. And so in order to be accepted by them, you have to turn off who you are and become what they want you to be because you want to be accepted by them more than you want to be accepted by him. And they don't have a hell or a heaven or a lake of fire. <laughs> All they got is words. And chances are the people who are trying to make you conform to them don't even like themselves. First Corinthians chapter nine. He says, say are these things as a man or saith not the law the same also. And you have to look at what he said prior to this in order to get the context of this verse. But I, I started here because what he's saying prior to this, he's saying the law is saying what I just said. <laughs> this is what he say. What I just said to you, the law says the same also. For it is written. In the law of Moses. Now understand that the translators put in the law of Moses. How many of you know Moses did not have a law? You see, the church world want us to think that Moses went up in the mountain and decided that he would write a bunch of laws to come down the mountain and give those hard-headed Jewish people he had just went to Egypt to bring out. How many of you know Moses was a scribe? You don't attribute the book of Jeremiah to the scribe that wrote it. The, the title is Jeremiah, but we know it was a scribe who wrote the book. The scribe don't get to put his name on the book. It's not the law of Moses. It's the law of Jehovah. He's the one who gave the law. But if the translators can make it the law of Moses, well, we don't have to do what Moses say. That's translation. And we're going to see that there are some serious issues with translations because, well, I'll get to that later. For it is written in the law, you shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Now, he asks a question. Is, 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 is Jehovah talking about oxen? Is this what he's talking about here? Or is he using a figure of speech? Don't muzzle the ox that tread the corn. What he's saying is that if the ox is out there working, let him eat from what he's working from. He should be able to eat if he's working. If a man don't work, neither shall he eat. But if a man does work, should he go hungry? Absolutely not. 
So Paul is saying, is, is Jehovah talking about ox here? Or say he it all together for our sakes. And then he explains, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written. Not about oxen, but about men. That he that plows should plow in hope, and that he that threshes should in hope should be partaker of his hope or work. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we should reap your carnal things? So what is he saying? We are bringing to you the word of life that wakens you spiritually. And then you have resources that you are supposed to support us from your natural carnal resources in exchange for this spiritual awakening we have brought to you. Now, here's the thing. We can't charge you for it. We can't charge you for the word that we're giving you. So now you have to reciprocate on your own free will because no one can make you do it. This was Israel's problem. You see, the natural rulers extract the taxes and don't give you an opportunity to pay them because they take them before you get your hands on them. Jehovah has never been that way. He says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you, and all I'm asking of you is to take a portion of that which I've given you and return it unto me. That's an act of, 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 of obedience, but it is also an act of worship. So we haven't addressed the issue that tithe and offerings are an act of worship. This is why we went back to Genesis with Abel and Cain. Abel and Cain had no instructions whatsoever on bringing tithe or bringing offerings, but the first thing we see is that they're bringing an offering. Jehovah accepts Abel's offering, rejects Cain's offering. Abel does one thing in the Bible, and the Bible says that Abel's blood is crying out from the ground all the way in the book of Hebrews. Abel is known for one thing, presenting an offering. That got him killed. 1 Corinthians 9, 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? And now what Paul is doing is he's associating, listen, there are people who've been commanded to receive the tithe. There's been people who've been commanded to receive the offerings from the hands of the Israelites. So Jehovah placed this power in their hand to receive from those who, whom they were supposed to bring. Paul is saying, if others be partake of, of this power, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Messiah. And then look at what he says. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things, what holy things, the temple, live of the things of the temple? And they... Who? The priests and Levites, which wait at the altar, are partakers with the altar. So he's talking about the priests and Levites. He's also talking about those who present, those who come to the feast. Everybody is a partaker. And then he goes on to say, even so hath Jehovah ordained. What is he ordaining? that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now you got these people out there talking about Paul. You see, what Paul decided to do was Paul's business. He says, listen, I've got the right to do it, but I choose not to. Now in 2 Corinthians, he later comes along and apologizes for not allowing the people to do what they should have been doing. As a result, these very people in Corinthians disown Paul. The very people that he planted, the per very people that he brought the gospel to said, hey, you know, you have no power over us. We don't want you to be our apostle. You know, there's Apollos, there's Peter, Kepha, there's Yeshua, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Kepha, I'm of Yeshua, I'm of whoever. And so all this carnality was going on in the Corinthians, in the congregation at Corinth. And ultimately, 
Paul had to get a little rough with him in his letters. And see, so he says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Paul, as an ambassador of the kingdom, was concerned about believers everywhere, especially in Jerusalem. So he encouraged people to support the saints in hard stricken areas. Now, when we get into this next verse, what you're going to see, and I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this because people have perverted the scriptures in more ways than one, especially Sunday preachers, which I used to be one of. First Corinthians chapter 16. I wanted to jump all the way over into Hebrews, but I felt that, you know, I was missing some in, in, in important information because someone along the line is going to say, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 16? Okay, what about it? Let's look at it. Now concerning, now notice what I do. I bold and underline. Now concerning the collection for the saints. Now you can miss this. As I have given over to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. What is this collection? The collection not from the saints, although they're coming from the saints, but it's collection for the saints, and we're going to see what these collections are. <laughs> they're not tithed and offerings, ladies and gentlemen. Let's address another issue. Upon the first of the week, now the word day there is in italics, which is an indication that it was added. Whenever you, and this is why I encourage people, if you're going to search and study the word, you have to do it with the King James Bible because most other versions out there, and I know there are people who say, well, King James was this and King James was that, and that's, that's fine. You don't have to read from the King James, but you can effectively study without having a good King James, regardless of how you feel about King James. You hear what I'm saying? Because King James gives us some notes. And if you have any kind of Bible, make sure you read the instructions. How many of you know that the book of instructions come with some instructions? If you don't read the instructions from the book that has instructions, you won't understand the instructions that come from the book because you didn't read the instructions in the book. See, the, the book tells you if you see something with parentheses, if you see something with italics, the writer, the translator, the, the, the person who put this together is trying to, he's saying, hey, flag here, flag here. Don't just read. Don't be speed reading. Stop for a moment because there's something here you need to see. We put italics here to, to say to you that while we were trying to interpret and translate the scriptures, there were portions that were missed, so we had to kind of piece together what we think the author was trying to say in order to convey to you that hole in this particular uh, writing that wasn't there. So you need to know that we've taken some liberty and inserted a word that we think belong here. Now, this teaching and these teachings are not for the faint at heart. Because people think, you know, oh boy, now you're trying to tell us that the, 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 the Bible's got some errors in it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's some things missing and there's some things added. That doesn't disqualify the book. You have to know what was added and what was, what's missing in order to not read into or to walk away from with an understanding that is really not what the book is trying to convey. So you have to be a mature person, not some baby whiner who every time somebody say, you know, there's an error in the Bible. Oh boy, there's a false preacher. <laughs> grow up, you see. Because if you don't grow up, you will be misled by the very people that Paul you're sure the Almighty says, listen, there's going to be some false teachers. There's going to be some false prophets. There's going to be some, well, how we know you ain't one? That's a good question. <laughs> how you know I'm not? 
How you know the one you listening to is not? How you know the ones you have been listening to over the course of your life is not? See, we want to ask those questions when somebody says something that is a little foreign to us while we've swallowed hook, line, and sinker all the other garbage that folks have been shoving down our throat for years. Yeah, I said, and I'm not taking it back. And I'm not trying to be mean. My wife is looking at me like, I'm not. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to provoke you unto good works. Some of you in here have matured enough to say, you know what? We should have been checking way back yonder because the very fact that you're here, I know everybody out here, how many of you, there may be a couple of people here, maybe a couple who came into the Hebrew faith at the very start. How many of you? One. How many of you have ever been to a church? Any denomination? Come on, raise your hand up high. How many of you, your parents went to church? How many of you, your parents took you to church? See there? So you are all been partakers of Sunday church. And now here you are in a Sabbath assembly. How'd you get here? And you brought some of that stuff you collected along the way with you that you're filtering the things that I'm saying through. I know you are because I did it. That's human. You got a brain. You're not, I'm not the first preacher you've listened to. You've listened to a whole lot of other preachers and you got sermons that you've memorized in your spirit as well as key words from certain sermons that when you hear something that contradicts that which you have already heard, it creates a sense of confusion. Well, wait a minute. That's not what my pastor said. My pastor said, my pastor said, and I'm hearing something that my pastor didn't say. So now that's confusing. I'm confused. Well, who's confusing you, me or your pastor? You got to determine that. But many have already made the determination because I'm not your pastor. I'm new. You've trusted the pastor. Your mom and dad trusted the pastor. Your brothers and sisters trusted the pastor. Your uncles and aunties and nephews and nieces, they all trust the pastor. We don't know you. So why should we listen to you? Don't listen to me. Listen to the word. Search the scriptures to see if the things that I'm saying is so, which you should have been doing while you were listening to your pastor. Now you won't come up in here talking about I'm confusing you. I'm not confusing you. I'm trying to bring clarity to the confusion you've been listening and living with all your life. For those of you who haven't been enlightened. In his letter to Timothy, Paul wrote, it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. We know that it's the love of money that is the root of all evil, and it is the will of the Almighty that his people walk in the blessings and the prosperity of Jehovah. In this teaching, True Biblical Prosperity, I take you on a journey to understand how to walk in the true prosperity of the Bible. You will learn whether or not it's okay to prosper, what prosperity look like. Understand that prosperity look different from person to person. Now, for your gift of $45 or more, Arthur would like to send you this four DVD collection, True Biblical Prosperity. Call the number on your screen, visit our website, or write Arthur Bailey Ministries, P.O. Box 1182, Fort Mill, South Carolina, 29716. Get your copy today. It will bless you in abundance. Upon the first day of the week. See, there it is. The first day of the week. Sunday worship. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
I have people call me and write me telling me, you know, you're preaching a false teaching. Jesus set us free from the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for the Jews. Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. And I challenge them, where is the Christian Sabbath in the Bible? You know, you got to find that one for me because I only see one. When I read the Bible, I only see one Sabbath. I don't see two different Sabbaths. I don't see a Sabbath for the Jews and a Sabbath for the Christians. And who was he talking to when he gave the Ten Commandments that you say you believe in? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Was he talking about the first day of the week or the seventh day of the week? So how did you get the idea that there is a Christian Sabbath? I know where you got it from, your pastor. And you didn't bother checking the Bible to see if what your pastor was saying was so. You just swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, and now here comes somebody saying, Sunday is not the Sabbath, and you say, that's confusing. <laughs> it's not confusing. It's been in the Bible all along. <laughs> Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by himself in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now what Paul here is doing is saying, listen, we need to raise some money, folks. And this collection is for the saints. And we're going to find out who these saints are. And here's what I'm doing is that I need you to begin the process because you have to understand in Paul's day, they didn't have jets. They didn't have cars, buses, and trains. Paul either walked or he, or he rode on some form of beast of burden. So his travel was very, very limited and he did much by letter. But one of the things that I need you to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number one, is the opening to this verse, now concerning. Now concerning the collection for the saints. See, when you see something like this, and Paul, Paul said this several times, he says, now concerning those matters, you wrote me. Now concerning this issue that you wrote me about concerning marriage. Now concerning that issue you wrote me about. See, we've got the letters Paul wrote, but we don't have the letters Paul is writing in response to. You see, the Corinthians wrote to him concerning this matter of collecting for the saints. So Paul, in his letter back to the Corinthians, saying, listen, and if you read 1 Corinthians with the idea that there is letters that Paul have, there's a letter that Paul have been written, has, has, has uh, wrote, or had been written to Paul, there were letters that had been written to Paul that Paul is responding to. And for you first timers, um, let me, let me just, because I know I'm, I'm saying some stuff that may sound a little out there, and it is. Because if somebody had said this stuff to me early in my Christian walk, I probably would have ignored them. Or I would have done like Mary did when she had the visitation from the angel and when Anna and Simeon ministered to her in Jerusalem, she pondered these things. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, when you come, either you have the Bible memorized, you pull out your Bible on your phone, or you got an actual hard copy, because I need you to follow me. The days are over for us to come and just simply listen. You need to search the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. Really, you do. And this is one of the things you're going to find out about me, which takes takes a while sometimes to get through a message is because I try to walk us through the Bible and give you not a whole lot of me that I cannot support from the Bible. First Corinthians chapter five, look at verse number nine. Now this is by the way, first Corinthians, right? So here's what we got. I wrote unto you in a letter 
I wrote unto you in a letter. Well, if he wrote unto them in a letter that was before this letter, then how is this letter the first letter that he wrote? Selah, I'll just let you ponder on that for a moment. There are places in this book some of you all are not ready to handle. You can't handle some of this stuff. This is why Yeshua said to his disciples, there's much I want to tell you, but you ain't ready. You aren't. Paul said to the, he opened up 1 Corinthians. He says, listen, brothers, when I came to you, I had to come to you carnally because you were carnal. These things that I write to you is like, you know, well, see, y'all taking me off course. First Corinthians chapter two. And here's what he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of Elohim. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Yeshua the Messiah and him crucified. You see this? What Paul is saying here is that I've decided that when I come to you, I'm going to bring to you the word of Jehovah and nothing else. In later on in chapter three, verse one, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Paul says, I'm dealing with a bunch of yahoos. Now, those of you who've watched Gulliver's Travel, <laughs> there were the winnings <laughs> and the yahoos. <laughs> anyway, get it back on track. He says, listen, when I came to you, I had to speak to you as Connell. And then he goes on to say, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to hear it, neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. And they got all these gifts going on, speaking in tongues, prophesying, healing, miracles, and yet they're carnal. You see, we can confuse the, the things of the spirit with spirituality. Yeshua says, you'll know a tree by its fruit, not by its giftings. You see, I don't care how anointed your preacher is. If your preacher is whoring around, if your preacher is sleeping around, then your preacher is a whore and a whoremonger. He's not only a whore, but he mongers among whores. <laughs> That's the Bible. See, the Bible is a rated R, in some cases, rated X book. But we want to treat it like it's a G rated. And you know, when, when, when Moses was talking about puri purity and sexuality and uncleanness and making babies, all of these was taught in the hearing of the entire community from cradle to grave. I don't know where we got children's church from. Oh, I know where we got it from. And you know, the babies, the babies, they got sensitive ears. You, you gotta, if you're going to talk like that, you got to send the babies out the room. Yeah, we send the babies out the room and the world raised the babies. You better raise your own babies. You better teach them what this Bible say before they bring a baby home. Now concerning the collections, basically what you could put here, now concerning those things you wrote me about, about the collecting for the saints. 
As I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, lay every man one, let, let every one of you lay by him in store. And you got Messianic Jews who want to talk about, you know, the reason why they did it on the first day of the week, because it was forbidden to carry money on the Sabbath. What? And where is that scripture? Show it to me. Well, you couldn't buy and sell. And where's that scripture? Well, the Bible says that they shouldn't work on the Sabbath. And so if you are in a place where people are working, you are compelling and making other people work. And I say, they'll be working if I weren't there. And then the same people tell you that you need to come up to the feast and we're going to get a hotel during the high days. And we're going to have food catered during the high days. And to keep you saints from buying and selling on the Sabbath day, you just pay for it in advance. Mm. Yeah. That's some brilliant stuff. So I pay for it in advance, and that way I don't have to exchange money, but I get the services that the money is paying for on the Sabbath day. See, there's always people who are adding to and taking away and then get angry when you point it out. It says, let everyone... There was no forbidding of carrying money because think about it. If you're not able to carry money, how are you going to help someone who is in distress? You remember the Pharisee and the, the uh, scribe who Yeshua gave the parable about the good Samaritan? They were on their way up to Jerusalem. They saw a man beaten, robbed, and left for dead. And they walked by him and act like they didn't see him. Yeshua says, now there was a Samaritan who came along, saw the man, picked the man up, took him to an inn, paid for the man's keep, and told the innkeeper, whatever it costs, I will cover the rest of the expenses on my way back. Yeshua says, who was the neighbor? How are you going to help people in distress if you're not able to help people in distress on the Sabbath day? Just because you have money don't mean you have to spend it. But I dare say, if you need help and you left all your money at home and on your way from worship to home, something happens to your ox that you rode in on and your ox need to be told. You're going to wish you had a brought your money. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. As God has prospered him that there be no gathering when I come and when I come, whosoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to you send to bring your liberality. Now I chose to look at this word to show it to you because this word, this liberality is the word grace. It's also the word gift, charis in the Greek. It's a monetary gift. They're going to bring it unto Jerusalem. So we see where the problem is. While delivering the gifts that Paul said he was going to take to the saints, Paul got arrested. And we read this in Acts chapter 24. They brought him to Felix and the high priest, and now Paul is standing before him, and he says, For as we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of that cult called the Nazarene, who also have gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law, 
But the chief captain Lysis came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto you, by examining of whom thyself makes take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that you have been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. These people don't speak for me. Let me speak for myself. Those preachers, those pastors, those Pharisees and Sadducees, those elders, those teachers, those apostles, prophets, evangelists, those bishops, those reverends, they don't speak for me. Let me speak for myself. Isn't this what Paul says? Because you may understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So Paul is going up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man. I wasn't out there arguing. I wasn't shoving my doctrine down anybody's throat. I wasn't confronting religious leaders about their off doctrines. I simply went to worship. Neither raising up the people, I didn't cause a problem, neither in the temple or in the synagogues, nor even in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. They've accused me of some things, but they can't prove it because the people who supposed to saw it didn't even come up. Listen, but this I confess. Even though they can't, can't prove anything they say, one thing I can tell you, they got right. I, this I confess unto you that after the way which they call heresy, they're saying that what I preach is heresy. So worship I the God of my fathers. And then look at what he said. Believing all things which are written in the law. Now Paul is speaking for himself. I know the preachers want to say, well, Paul was teaching against the law. Paul does no such thing. Paul says, I believe all things which are written in the law and I'm doing it. I'm up in Jerusalem. I'm in the synagogues. I'm in the city. And these people are accusing me of heresy. But the heresy that they are accusing me of is the very thing that they themselves are preaching minus one thing. They reject the Messiah that the law that they teach said was coming. I recognized him. Matter of fact, he recognized me. Paul was on his way to Damascus and the Almighty slapped him off of that horse, blinded him, had him go to Ananias. He laid hands on him. The scales fell off of his eyes. And the very thing that Paul persecuted, Paul became part of. And and I have hope toward God, just like them, which they themselves also they allow that there be no resu- that there that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious, void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation. The word alms there is these gifts for the poor and offerings. So Paul is saying, I'm I'm bringing my alms, that which I've collected, that which I commanded those congregations in Galatia and the Corinthians, We've collected that. I'm bringing these to the poor because we're going to find out, and maybe not today, that there was a famine and there was persecution and Paul was helping out the the saints in Jerusalem. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia, certain Jews from Asia found me purified. They found him purified, purified. 
You're telling me Paul is purifying himself in Acts chapter 24? I thought Paul was teaching against the law. They found him, I'm in the temple, mind your own business. I'm in the temple. They come snatching me out of the temple. I'm in there worshiping. I'm purified. I've done according to the law. I'm not unclean. They found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and eject if they had ought against me. In other words, what he's saying, the people who found me and then started telling the high priest, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And the high priest takes their word for it and then drag me up in front of you and the people who supposed to saw me doing the things they're accusing me of, they're not even here. Who ought to have been here before you and object if I'm saying anything that I shouldn't be saying if they had all against me. The things they're saying they've made up, they've lied on me and there's not one single witness that can testify against what I'm saying because according to the law, my witnesses are to face me or those who saw me, my accusers, I'm to face my accusers, but they're not even here. Or else, let these same here, the ones who listened to those lies and brought me up in front of you, let them say if they have found any evil doing in me. They are listening to what somebody else said. And then taking it on and bringing me in front of you like I'm some guilty person. Did they not find me in the temple? Was I not purified? Was I not in there worshiping? Did I create a problem in the city? Did I create a problem in the temple? Did I create a problem in the synagogue? Did you see me do any of these things? No. Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them. In other words, I'm guilty of one thing, and I think this might be why they did this. Because you got to understand something. If you understand Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, and they controlled the temple. The Pharisees controlled the synagogues. The Pharisees controlled the synagogue. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They controlled the temple. Paul is talking about the resurrection in the temple that is controlled by the Sadducees who don't believe in a resurrection. Paul is saying, you know, I'm racking my brain and, and there's only one thing I can think that I'm here for. Now, I know what they're accusing me for, but if they brought to you what they were actually accusing me for, there is no law against what I'm doing. That's a doctrine. If you remember in one place when he was brought before him, he created a distinction because he saw there were Sadducees and there were Pharisees and he began to talk about the resurrection and then all of a sudden they started fighting among each other and Paul got let go. Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question by you this day. Now, the Hebrew writer connects the tithe to Abraham. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. For this Melchizedek, to whom also gave, Abraham gave a tenth. Now that word there is tithe, and he gave a tenth part of all. He gave a tithe of all. And so we see the first mentioned principle of the tithe dealing with Abraham. No Levites, no priests, no tabernacle, no temple. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually, now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth tithe of the spoil. And then you got these people, oh, see, there it is. Abraham only gave a tenth of the spoil. 
Go back and read. He gave a tithe of all. He took none, but everybody else, the men that came with him, the kings who helped him fight, and then the, the souls. Abraham didn't take anything. But is that to say that's the first time Abraham, I mean, think about it. Abraham comes back from, a, from, from, from war and there's this fella that shows up for the very first time. And Abraham, after warring with all of these people, decided that he's going to take a tenth of all he had and give it to this stranger whom he knew nothing about. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Would you have done it? How did Abraham know who he was? Why would Abraham give him anything? And why a tenth? And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, they receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people. The people had the command to give the tithe. The, the Levites had the command to receive the tithe. Of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. In other words, he's saying the Levites came out of Abraham, but those who weren't even, that the one that wasn't even a Levite didn't even come from Abraham. Abraham gave a tithe. Abraham didn't give a tithe down. Abraham gave a tithe up. But let's keep reading. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witness that he lived forever. And as I may say, the writer says, Levi also received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. And we looked at a, a couple of weeks ago how the Levites were responsible for tithing from the tithe. For he, Levi, was yet in the loins of his father. So the Hebrew writer uh, associates Abraham as the father of Levi when, in fact, the son of Abraham was Isaac. The son of Isaac was Jacob, whom Jehovah changed his name to Israel. And Levi was three generations removed from Abraham. Yet Abraham is paying tithes and Levi, who, who hasn't been born yet, is paying tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. And we'll, we'll close here in just a moment. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood for under it the people received the law. Those of you who've got a King James Version, you'll notice. Parentheses. What further need was there that another priest... Those of you who've got a King James Version, you'll notice italics. Go and read the instructions to your book. What further need was there from was all the way down to the question mark is all italicized. That another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek. That another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. Now notice what the interpreters, translators are doing here. Because what they're doing here is they're saying that another priesthood should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. The, the simple fact that there's after is an indication that this came later. But get this. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, here's the question. Was Melchizedek after Aaron or before? Now, some of you all will get this later, and I'm going to leave you hanging because I want you to ponder and meditate. Now we've already established 
There are people who think that the law came through Moses. Why? Because that's what the commentary of John said, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus, that the law came through Moses. And people think, okay, well, Moses wrote the law in Mount Sinai. And therefore, in Exodus chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are first shot down, is where the law begins. And yet the same theologians say the law is the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Well, if the law is the first five books of the Bible, then it's not Genesis the law because Abraham came in Genesis chapter 12. His encounter with Melchizedek came a few chapters later, long before Moses went up into the mountain. And so the question, does Melchizedek come after Aaron or do Aaron come after Melchizedek? The answer, as you already know, is that Aaron came after Melchizedek, which indicates that the priesthood Jehovah had in mind was established long before. See, the reason why Moses went up into the mountain to receive the written commandments is because the people didn't want to hear Jehovah tell them what he desired of them. Exodus 19. Jehovah told Moses to get the people, bring them to the mountain. Exodus 20, then Jehovah said all these words. He's speaking. Exodus chapter 20, around verse 17. Let's go there. Verse number 17 is the last of the Ten Commandments. Verse 18, and all the people saw the thunder and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they moved themselves away from Jehovah. Jehovah is speaking here, ladies and gentlemen. Jehovah is speaking to his people. That's how he desired to communicate. That's how he communicated with Abraham. That's how he communicated with Adam, with Cain, with Abel, with Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses. And now here he is trying to speak to his people, but his people don't want to hear it. Instead, they want a pastor to tell them what God said. I don't have time to hear God myself, so you will pay you. You go listen for him, and then you come and preach us a 20-minute sermon. And we'll believe what you say. Whatever you say God said, that's what we'll do. When Jehovah desires to speak to you, he wants a relationship with you. He don't want your pastor, your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your children, or anyone between you and him. Nobody. And anybody who tries to insert themselves between you and the Almighty is in a dangerous position. And if you are that person, you better get out of the way because Jehovah is jealous. He'll kill you. He is a jealous Elohim. And he don't want anybody in between you and him because those who are led by him, they are his children. Not those who are led by their denominations. Not those who are led by their preachers. Not those who are led by their husbands or by their wives or by their mothers or fathers. But those who are led by his spirit. They are the sons of the Almighty. Glory. Somebody got liberated today. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, as we bring this teaching to a close, we've gone from Genesis all the way to, (laughs) and now the rain comes. See, I mean, that, that, the rain, that's beautiful. That's, that's the rain, y'all, you Pentecostals waiting on the latter rain. (laughs) There it is. That's not, we're talking about that spiritual rain. What spiritual rain? 
How does it rain in the spirit? Oh, it's oh, gold dust. Ladies and gentlemen, don't put your faith in man. Put your faith in what the word says. And what we've done is that we've tried to help remove the blinders, the glasses, the doctrines, the teachings, the sermons. And don't take my word for it. You all have read plenty of scripture. And when you come, take notes. One of the things you're going to find out about the teachings that I do. Now, I've been in churches most of, most of my life. And I've taken notes. I get home and try to read the notes that I took from a sermon. And I can't make sense of them. Because the preacher done took me all over the place. I'm trying to make a connection from the scripture. The scriptures don't connect. Why? Because they're taken all out of context. They've spiritualized the message and used the Bible to support their teaching. And when you try to research the scriptures they gave you, the scriptures don't fit with the teaching. One of the things that I've tried to do is I've tried to take you from scripture to scripture to scripture in the context in which they are written. And that's what you want. Because if you take notes here, you're going to be able to go back and follow the notes, and have something you can make sense of. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the, the task that you've given to share the things that you have given to, to be shared. I thank you for those who are willing and open to hear from you. I thank you for those who Seek your face. Those who are skeptical, I pray that you will show yourself to them and to make them to know your truth. Help them to grow closer in their walk and in their faith in you. I pray that that divine connection is made. And just as you desire to speak to your people who refuse to hear and instead put a mediator, Moses, between them and you. I pray that your people will not do that, but they will desire to know you so that you can speak to them. Yeshua said, his sheep, your sheep, know your voice, the voice of a stranger they will not follow. And we know that there are so many voices there's our parents' voice. There's our spouse' voice. There's our preacher's voice and elders and deacons' voice. There's talking heads on radio, televangelists. There's so many different voices out there, all seemingly to be contradictory of one another having this in common, Sunday, Christmas, and Easter, all opposing your command. Surely, all those people can't be wrong. What rationale? You've called us to reason with you, not to reason against you. I pray that you will open our eyes, our ears, and that you will take us into the truth of your word and that we will come to know this truth of ourselves. You said that we shall know the truth, intimately know the truth, and the truth will make us free. It will free us from man-made religion, man-made doctrines, the commandments of men and traditions, that we might walk in step with you, fighting the good fight, running our race with patience, listening and being led by your voice and spirit. Father, we bless you today. I pray that you will give us understanding of the things that have been said and that we will be like Bereans were. We will search the scriptures to see if these things that have been said today are so. Father, I bless you. We bless you. And may you be glorified now, even in our giving, in our tithe, in our offerings, even through the questions and prayers, may you manifest yourself. May you bring healing and deliverance and wholeness Set captives free, open blind eyes and ears. 
Father, we thank you. We thank you for the clarity today. We thank you for clearing up the confusion today. We thank you for insight. We thank you, Father, for removing that storm cloud from over us. And, and, and I sense the Father wanting to deliver um, people from depression. It's the word, depression. Just want to take a moment. And as an act of faith, if you hear battle or deal with any form of depression, especially if you have been prescribed some form of depression medication, I want to pray specifically for you because I sense the spirit of Jehovah wanting to deliver from depression. If that's you, please stand where you are. If you're online, then this is for you as well. If you're dealing with depression, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't allow shame to stop you from receiving what Father has for you today. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Father, I know that you reveal things because you want to address them. And therefore, as an act of faith, and calling these things out, and by faith, your people responding to them, I pray in the name of Yeshua, by the blood of the Lamb, that the spirit of depression lifts now. Deliver now. Heal now in the name of Yeshua. Depression, you have no right. You have no authority. You loose the people of Jehovah and you go now. And Father, we thank you for calling this out. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your presence and power to deliver and to set free from oppression and depression. And we claim it in faith and declare that by the stripes of Yeshua, depression be gone. Hallelujah. And Father, we just give you praise for that. We bless you for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Mm. And, and I really don't sense he's, he's done because oppressive relationship. Oppressive relationship. And it don't matter who you are. If you, if you are in a a situation, you may, not, you may not have been diagnosed with depression. You may not necessarily be dealing with depression, but there is oppression from someone that you are in relationship with. And I think I, I'm sensing that it's more a man, woman, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend relation but it also can be a parent relation. If you are dealing with an oppressive relationship, I believe today, Father want to give you wisdom to release you from that. Anyone here? Anyone else? And this is certainly for you who are joining us online. See, one of the things, and, and, and I ask Father, um, and I don't look for this, but when we pray for him to stir up his spirit, um, there are times when Father, when we show up in the presence of the Almighty, he, he literally want to deal with some things. He want to deal with things, he want to deal with people, and he really want people to be free. He want people to be free. He don't want people to be under the yoke of anything other than him. And so if you are dealing with an oppressive relationship, 
I'm going to give you a little more time and then I'm going to pray for the spirit of oppression to go and for the strength of the Almighty to be released upon you to stand up against oppression no matter where it's coming from. You are not to be under anyone's control other than the control of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who is oppressing you is not only hurting you, they're hurting themselves. Because the gift and the power that the Almighty has placed in you can't come out. They're oppressing it. And they're missing out on who you are and what Father has placed in you. And so now your relationship is stifled. The thing about us as human beings is that the Father has designed us in a way that we are going to come out from under oppressive relationships. And oftentimes, because we don't know how to do it the right way, we'll do it the wrong way and further cause damage. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are not an oppressor that you set captives free from all manner of oppression, that we're only to be slaves of yours, not slaves to any man. We thank you for your presence, your power, your deliverance. I pray that you give your people insight and strength on how to stand firm against all manner of oppression. In every relationship, I pray that you will cause strength and courage. We come against the spirit of fear. What would happen if I do this? What would happen if I say that? I'm better off keeping my mouth shut. Father, I pray that you give wisdom on how to speak, words to speak, courage to speak in love and in power. I pray for the angels of heaven that have been assigned to your people to encamp about them and to strengthen and minister to them in that time. Father, that by your spirit, you will cause your people to rise up and to stand and to take a stand. We know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, spiritual weakness, and rulers of darkness. I thank you that you've given us power over all the works of the enemy. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, and I release that and command your people to walk in power, in the soundness of mind, and in love, and to resist all manner of fear and oppression in Yeshua's name. And we thank you for that. Hallelujah. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4.4, when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, To bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he with, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith Jehovah of hosts. 
When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.